Hello, Keith Kaiser here with another study in God's Word. We're doing studies in the book of Acts, and we're in Acts chapter 5. Verse 33 is where we begin today. And the scene is that the apostles have continued to preach and teach in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This has resulted in opposition. There's been direct persecution on the part of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council with their high priests and their officers. And they've arrested the apostles, imprisoned them, but God has not only preserved their lives, he's miraculously freed them through an angel. And the apostles haven't backed down. They continue to boldly witness that Jesus is the Christ. They say he's both Lord and Christ, and God has made this apparent by the resurrection and by the coming of the Holy Spirit. So now there's something interesting that occurs. Rather than them being uh, killed at this point, as they could have been, humanly speaking, or rather than them trying to re-imprison them, uh, we see that one of their members, one, someone in the council, steps up, and it's this rabbi named Gamaliel, or some say Gamaliel. Don't know what the true pronunciation of his name is. He's well known in extra-biblical Judaica. Extra-biblical Jewish history knows him as one of the great theological sages of the Second Temple period. In other words, he was one of the great rabbis and theologians of the era of Christ and his apostles. So Acts chapter 5, verse 33, when they heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill them. So they're very angry. They have not been placated by the answers of the apostles, neither scriptural argumentation nor the wonder that the Lord has done in miraculously releasing them from incarceration has changed their mind. They're angry and they want to kill them. They want to shut their mouths by murder. And so even though they murdered the Son of God, they're completely impenitent. In other words, unrepentant. They haven't changed their mind about Jesus of Nazareth. They think he's a blasphemer, a criminal, a false messiah. They want to wipe out and efface his name from the annals of human history and destroy anyone who preaches them. So they're plotting to kill them. But then something happens. Verse 34. Then one in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel. Now, the Pharisees, of course, were the opposing theological party of the Sadducees. Earlier in verse 17, we read about the sect of the Sadducees. That was the group that the high priest and the coterie that was uh, controlling the temple precincts, they belonged to the Sadducees. And as we said, they were the theological modernists. They believed in uh, what we call theological liberalism, where they didn't really see religion as being a supernatural thing. They were interested in outward religion. They were interested in ceremony. They were interested in ethics, no doubt that flowed from that. But as far as the supernatural aspects like angels and resurrection, those things they denied. Now the Pharisees, by contrast, they're the theological right. They are the religious right, the theological conservatives, who not only hold to a literal interpretation of the Bible, but they go even farther than that. They had added to the scripture. So we see the two extremes, and both of them are equally false. The Sadducees are the type of people to take away from the Bible. The Pharisees are the sort of people to add to the Bible. And either way, the Bible itself tells us none of it shall ye add to nor take away. That's not what we're to do. We're to stand on the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and not take away from it nor to add to it. So now one of these Pharisees, the theological conservatives, Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in respect by all the people, it says, and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. So he's going to step forth, and he's sort of like the theological equivalent of E.F. Hutton. The old ads for E.F. Hutton, the investment house, said when, when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. He'd always have some group of people on the commercial that would be talking, and suddenly the E.F. Hutton broker would open his mouth for some sort of financial pearl of wisdom to fall from, and everybody would be quiet, look around, and the tagline would come up, come up when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. Well, Gamaliel carried that kind of theological heft. He was uh, a spiritual heavyweight in their view, quite a great theologian and sage. And so they put the apostles out, and now this is going to be an internal discussion among themselves of these. And he says, verse 35, he said to them, Men of Israel, 
Take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago, Thutis rose up, claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about four hundred, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away many people after him. He also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. And now I say to you, Keep away from these men and let them alone, for if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. Now we have to remember this was a tumultuous time in history. The Romans were ruling over the world, and yet uh, wherever they were, there was also groups of people that wanted to overthrow the Romans. There were people in Israel, the Zealot Party, for instance, that wanted to do away with the rule of Rome and wanted independence. And even after the time uh, that we're reading about now, there would eventually be the first Jewish revolt starting in AD 66 that lasted till the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. And actually parts of it continued on till Masada fell, I think around AD 73, if memory serves. So uh, there were these folks who wanted to oppose Roman rule. And Gamaliel refers to some of these historic persons, to Theudas and to Judas of Galilee, who were both people that tried to raise a rebellion against the Roman rule and uh, gain independence. And later there would be a second Jewish revolt in the second century, I think about uh, 135 to 130, 132, somewhere in there. And then what they call the Bar Kokhva rebellion, meaning in Aramaic, the son of the star, because Bar Kokhva was this figure who rose up and uh, was claimed to be Messiah and identified by others, I think Rabbi Akiva, as Messiah. So there was that revolt as well. But in both cases, the Romans crushed these revolts and Israel continued to be under the domination of the Gentile powers. It was what the Lord Jesus called the times of the Gentiles. Now here, Gamaliel, recognizing those two historic precedents, he says, you know, the same thing could happen here. I mean, we've seen this before. We've seen people rise up and claim to be a deliverer sent from God, claim to be Messiah. And uh, they've come to nothing because obviously God wasn't with them. It wasn't God's will for them to come forward and do it. But if these men are of God, well, you can't fight against God. You can't overthrow what God's doing. So you better leave these men alone. Now, there's a certain logical rationale to that, you know, just sort of sit on the fence and wait and see. But the problem is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and his work admits no halfway measure. You can't sit on the fence about the Lord Jesus. He himself said, you are either for me or against me. And while this for the moment, brought about peace. As I said in an earlier study, this was the providence of God. God uses this man to step up and offer this temporizing opinion, to offer a strategy that is going to keep them from killing the apostles. So providentially, without supernaturally intervening, and totally in keeping with what Gamaliel thought, what his own opinion was, and what he wanted to say, God wasn't coercing him into this, Nevertheless, this whole thing is used to preserve the lives of the apostles because it says in verse 40, and they agreed with him. And when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they beat them once more. And it's amazing how uh, briefly and tersely the Bible says that, that they beat them. And, and I mean, if I were beaten like they were beaten, I'd probably write large volumes about how bad it was for me to suffer. But the Bible just says they were beaten. You know, this was what would happen to believers in Christ. And the Lord Jesus suffered far worse than a mere beating. He was beaten as well. He was buffeted. He was scourged. He was smitten and afflicted, as the Bible says. But eventually he died under the wrath of God as a sacrifice for sin. So what they were doing in suffering for his body's sake, suffering to further the gospel, suffering that the name of Jesus might be upheld and known and, and save other people and leave us an example. 
that as first peter 2 says for this cause uh, christ has called you to suffer has left you an example that you might uh, follow his example and uh, suffer even as the lord suffered at the hands of men so were they going to suffer and and we see it happening here but as far as gamaliel and the council this wasn't the right tact i mean they should really decide is jesus of god or not is he genuine or not do his messianic claims his claims to be the savior from god do they carry weight well some people today say well someday we'll know you know when messiah comes we'll know the lady at the well in john 4 tried to do that sort of thing she said when messiah comes he'll tell us all things someday you know we'll know well don't put off knowing because god has been actively revealing himself through his word God's message has been going forth, this teaching and preaching in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the message that saves. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10 says. And we can't put off a decision about it if we say, well, I'll wait till I die, then I'll find out. Or I'll wait till Jesus comes, then I'll find out. That's too late. You'll find that he is Lord and he is Christ, but it'll be too late for you. He'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. And you'll be cast into the lake of fire forever and ever. What the Lord Jesus described as outer darkness, where the worm does not die and where the flame is not quenched. It's so awful. It is needless because the Lord Jesus came into the world to save sinners. The Lord Jesus came and died on the cross so that you might not perish but have everlasting life. He came to give you eternal life as a gift if you'll believe on him. So don't sit on the fence. Make a choice. Come to the Lord Jesus and say, Lord you're right, I am that bad. And the only way I could be saved is for the Son of God to become a man and to die on the cross for my sins and to rise again, showing that that's the way of salvation, showing that you are who you claim to be. I believe, Lord, save me from my sins. In whatever way you tell God that, if you're sincere, he'll save you because it's not about you, it's about him. It's about the work of salvation he's done through his Son. And however bad you've been and whatever you've been doing, the Lord Jesus can save you. So verse 41, we see the reaction. They departed from the presence of the council. Notice rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. So who wins here? Well, not the Sanhedrin. <laughs> You're not going to shut these apostles up. You're not going to close their mouths. They're going to keep teaching and preaching the Lord Jesus. They're going to go right back to the temple and in every house, publicly and in privately, they're going to do this. And Paul would talk about his witness later on in Acts 20 and say that publicly and from house to house, I preached repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what they were doing as well. And they were rejoicing, not dismayed by their suffering. Now, they weren't masochists. They didn't enjoy pain. And they weren't people that were callous to suffering. They, they felt these blows. They felt these whippings. They felt the scourging and the shame and all these things heaped upon them. But they had a greater joy that they were willing to suffer for. I'm willing to suffer for this because it's a privilege to suffer for the Lord Jesus. As Philippians 1 would tell us, that is given to you not only to believe, but to suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the great privilege we have as believers. And so they weren't dismayed. They didn't stop. They didn't diminish their uh, obedience to the Lord. They continued preaching. Now, this is really a question of obedience, because when the apostles preach in verse 32, they refer to those whom God has given who obey him. So if you obey the gospel, God gives you the Holy Spirit. You get that boldness. You get that joy. You get that which transcends circumstances, that even overcomes persecution and opposition. And you want to go on and serve the Lord. Uh, the other thing is, of course, that Gamaliel speaks about obedience here. And he talks about uh, those who, uh, if they're going to fight against them, he says, all they who obeyed Judas of Galilee in verse 37 were dispersed. So the question is, are you going to obey the Lord Jesus or are you going to obey man? If you obey man, it will come to nothing. Gamaliel's right about that. 
But if you obey the apostolic gospel, the gospel the apostles preached, because it was from God, it was given through the Holy Spirit, it was about his risen son, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you obey that message, that makes all the difference in the world. That's what saves. And that's what empowers for service. So it's a question of whom will I obey? Am I going to obey man? Am I going to obey this world and their thinking? Well, it has a course. The world is headed someplace. It's headed toward judgment. It's headed toward the wrath of God. But if you obey the Lord Jesus, you'll head somewhere too. Not to judgment, but you'll head to be delivered from this world into the presence of God for all eternity. And while you wait for the Lord to come and receive you to himself and deliver you from the wrath to come and transform your body to be a body fit to be in his presence for glory, already you'll be enjoying the Lord because the Lord will be living in you by his spirit. That's what comes to those who know the Lord Jesus. So may we rejoice in anything we must suffer for God's sake in this world. May we not be embittered against God because of our suffering, but may we rather rightly see it as a privilege. He died for me. He suffered far worse than me in giving his son. The son of God suffered more than I could ever suffer. So whatever I'm called to suffer, it's a privilege. It's something that's tremendous. And we say, I'm amazed that I'm counted worthy if God brings us into a position where others speak against us or laugh at us, or imprison us, or even beat us and kill us. We won't be the loser. Rather, God will confess us. The Son of God himself will confess us before the Father and his angels one day. So we have a wonderful salvation. And thank you very much for listening.